right? Okay. You tell me when. Like I said, hold the questions till the till after. We'll just go straight through the program and uh, go from there. As soon as Tim gives me the thumbs up, we will start. The knees are the first thing to give out. So we got another one next week that's going to be about sellers, same same type of deal here, but sellers. Okay, so hopefully this will kind of get you through the process and probably the best way, well, hopefully one good way to do things. And uh, there's lots of ways to skin a cat, but uh, this is what I recommend and a lot of you know the things that uh, that go on. Uh, come on, we're recording anyway, so. I don't know if it's the internet or what. Look at Dan out of the picture. You can start. I can play with okay. All right. This will be uh, handling a client from A to Z. Buyers. Okay. I'm uh, Rick Williams, Andy Broker Kale. And we're going to go over this, you know, from the beginning to end, and uh, the manner. There is not only one way to do it, but this is a way that you know I recommend. That we get a couple different samples of you know the way, but this is just a one way to go through the process from beginning to end. Writing the initial offer, okay? You have a client and uh, they want to write it off. That's the first step, okay? You've gone through, they want to write this offer. I suggest you utilize the 7.0 contract. You do not have to. There's nothing mandated that says there are other contracts that are newly redone as well. You know, there's a condo, there's a condo contract in car. There are other ones, okay? Don't use the 6.1 though, okay? That one is now outdated, it is the 7.0, that would be the preferred one. When I say you can use others, I mean others that are now, they've all been updated actually. So there's a couple, there's about three or four different contracts. But the 7.0 is the most common. It's the 13 page that gives you, it answers all the questions, checks all the boxes, so let's put it that way. It's probably the best because of that. Okay, and it does it doesn't leave things to the imagination. All those the other forms, which are only three or four pages, just leaves out information that uh, I think is imperative to the deal. All right, um, fill in all the information on the offer, including the mortgage lender and the attorney information with contact information if it is known at this time. Be certain to fill in the listing agent information in full before emailing the contract. This is of the utmost importance because this is where the lender orders the appraisal loan. Remember, when you're on the buy side, obviously you're filling in your information, clearly, or it autofills for you because, you know, it will do that, okay? But it will also autofill the other side if you did it right. If you actually search it and find it, it autofills the listing side, so you don't even have to. This is why I recommend highly that you learn how to use dot loop, and if you use it correctly, your job is significantly easier. Uh, instead of filling out information, which many, <clears throat> having that I go over every single contract that you guys put together, I see so many that are erroneously done. And the problem is uh, not being filled out more than anything else. When I say erroneous, they're just not complete. Okay, and a lot of that is the listing information, the other 
agent, okay? And that would simply be remedied by just using Docker the proper way, okay? Um, now, the other reason, as I said right in that, the second bullet point there, is that when the lender gets this contract, you have to understand what happens and how this process works, and that's what this class is all about. It goes to the lender, the lender goes, okay, we need to order the appraisal, everyone knows that the listing agent has the keys, right? Okay, not the buyer. And who wrote the contract? The buyer agent did, okay? Buyer agents, like I said, don't oftentimes, they miss putting in listing information. Well, then what do they do? What does that lender do? They order the appraisal and only put the buyer agent on there because they don't, they're not gonna sit there and call figure out who's the listing agent and this, that. You know, they don't have time for that. They're simply ordering an appraisal with the only name that they have. And if they have the wrong one, which is the buying agent, okay, because that's going to be on there, I hope. <laughs> I hope both aren't blank. I haven't seen that too often. But, um, but I have seen it, by the way. Okay? Um, yeah, which means, in my opinion, you shouldn't get paid. Okay? In my opinion, see, this is the other one. Because if you're that negligent, why should you get paid? You're not even on the contract. You know, let's just take this in depth to the end. If you've sat there and put this in front of a, you know, a judge, and there was a case, why would you get paid? You don't even appear on the contract. Okay? I feel like doing that sometimes when I see these with you guys. You know, not you, not anyone necessarily in this class. But I feel like doing that. Like, why should we pay them? They didn't even think enough to put their own name on the contract. You know, that constitutes payment. Okay, that's how you get paid. That's what the MLS, the MLS is the contract that binds us all. And the fact that you put your name there and you put, you know, agent ID 138308, you know, that's mine, that ensures that I get paid. Okay, because of the MLS, assuming it's an MLS listing and everything else. You know, those are assumptions and the thing. You know, you just gotta follow the legality of how this whole system works. Okay, now getting back to the lender. The lender calls the buyer's agent because it's the only name on there. The buyer agent goes, I don't have the keys. You know, I can't get you know, I can't get in there. Which you can't. Okay? So, you know, you have to call the listing site. Why don't the listing's name? Do you have it? Let's say you're in the field. You may not have it. Okay? Well, what's happening now is you're delaying the entire your process of getting paid, ultimately, because the closing. Okay, and you're you are you are stopping the whole transaction to somewhat of a screeching halt because typically near the end is the appraisal. That's near towards the end. So everything else has been going on and smoothly. And now, because you wrote the contract improperly, and people wonder why it's taking so long. I, oh, I've said it as an appraiser sometimes. Well, you know, did you write the contract? You know, because you know, I, I hear them saying stuff like, you know, this, is, this process is taking too long, like the, the whole loan and the appraisal process. You just don't get it, do you? You know, you're the one that actually delayed the process if the buyer agent is talking to me. But you know what? It goes right back to the listing agent as well. The listing agent could have put their name on it, and they should have. Okay? They should have finished that side of the equation, you know, that side of the contract. So now you're holding up the whole process, okay? Eventually everybody finds it, right? Okay. But from an appraisal side, I'm an appraiser, as you guys know, I, can't, I, I don't have time either to go sit and I'll do it, but I may not do it that moment. If I have everything in front of me and it's laid up, you know, in front of me, well, of course I'm going to call the listing agent. That's the, that's my, that's the contact. Okay. Otherwise, I got to look it up, just like you, anyone could do that. In the, in the MLS, we can all do that. We all have the access. But why should we have to when that should have been done by the agent who proposed, supposedly wants to get paid? Okay. So you know, my point in all of this is do your job. If you want to make processes smooth and, and, and actually go from beginning to end in a natural manner that doesn't cause delays because of anything you've done, then do all the right things off the rock. And this is one of them. Finish that contract regardless of what's going on there. Another big thing these days now is it also says it's mandatory to actually write the buyer's information and the seller's, including an email and or telephone number. Okay, now, the fact that I do the title, I'm seeing that missing sometimes. I'm loving that I am seeing it on there the majority of the time. That way, I can send all the disclosures that happen to be with River's title right to them. 
Sometimes they're not there, you know, um, and it's, it's problematic a little bit because you're not being able to get access to everybody, okay? Next step of this is locate the disclosures within the, the listing in the MLS. If they are provided, they're under additional information. You know, all of you know how to get, you know, and, and, and this rhetorical question here, to get disclosures on a listing, you click the additional on the upper right, additional uh, information there, rolls all the way down to the bottom on the right, it will say whether or not the disclosures are there or not. If they are not, then you call the listing agent, whose obviously phone number and or email is right there, and you ask, say, hey, I do not have the disclosures, they're not in the MLS, can you please send them to me, I'm about to make an offer. So it's a good excuse to tell them that an offer is coming in the next hour or two hours or whatever your time frame is, and you need the disclosures, okay? Can you submit a contract without disclosures? Absolutely. Okay, is it better when you do it with it? Yes, okay, it's a complete contract. Yeah. Um, so that's where you look for it first. If you do not find, now you know. Look educated, look first, okay? Seem educated, I should say. Look first, see if it's there, not there, now you call the agent. You know, it's somewhat embarrassing, or it should be to you, if you call and they go, it's right on the listing. And so all you gotta do is go down. You should know that is what I'm getting. Okay, so, uh, this, um, if they're not providing the listing, proceed to call the listing broker, request all the disclosures necessary as we just state. Make sure that you have all the docs necessary to submit a proper offer. This includes the contract, the 7.0 contract to purchase, <coughs> all disclosures that are necessary. Okay, when I say all disclosures, just so you know, even if the other side didn't do something, it's still your responsibility as the buyer agent, this is what we're talking about here, to represent your client in the best manner, and that means to get the right disclosure because you're protecting your client. All we care about, and IDFPR cares about, is that we're doing the best job for our client. And right now, today, we're talking about buyers. And let's say they're, you know, in there, you get the disclosures, and they have the radon, they have the real property disclosure, and there's no lead. And the thing was built in 1930. Okay, and as we know, anything <clears throat> built before 1978 needs to have, by Illinois law, the lead-based paint disclosure. So even if the seller side did fill it out and didn't send it to you, or it wasn't on the additional, your protection for your client should be, you know, the excuse that oh, the seller didn't provide it, the listing agent didn't provide it. Not an excuse. It's not an excuse. You're doing your due diligence in protecting your client and you're, you're going to take, hey, I don't have the lead-based paint disclosure. Can you please have your seller fill that out? And I get a lot of the agents, a lot of you guys also, well, isn't that the attorney's job? I'm going to get you off right now and let you know something. Attorneys don't do anything, okay? Let me just lay it right out there. If you think an attorney is going to do anything when it comes to this, you want to know what an attorney does? on a transaction in real estate, the only thing that they do, they check like three blanks, the pertinent issues, and they'll write a letter back and forth to fire off, okay? $500 doesn't move their, you know, they, you know, they can care less. That's all they're making, five, six, seven hundred. That is not something. And then I'm speaking about 98% of them, okay? <clears throat> they don't check the whole contract. They don't do all the things, as I hear that all the time. Isn't that their job? I'm not saying it's not their job. I'm telling you what they do, okay? So it is your responsibility. You are held to a higher level. You have to be everything in the transaction. If you want to be a good broker, you're the attorney to tell us not to practice law. I say, forget about that. I don't mean go practicing law, but I mean know the law. And know what you need, know what your client is supposed to have. And that protects you as an agent, because you should know all this stuff, and your client. You're better than that. You're better than the attorney. You're the best broker out there in every other part of this you know, aspect of this transaction, from the lender, every side of it. And you should know every little piece of this transaction and how to be better than even them doing their own little piece. You know how to marry. Do you should. Okay. Um, and at first you don't pretend you do. Okay. Uh, or ask me, you know, and I will tell you what to do and how to do it. But in this first case here, we're talking about protect your client. Go get that lead-based paint. If for whatever reason it's not there, like we 
you get it a lot. And then Rob will say, hey, we're missing this. Go get it. I know the lender, the, the, uh, the seller didn't fill it out. I can get that. Okay, well now protect your client. Okay, do your job. Okay, um, also provide, you have the disclosures that are all in there, so this is a complete uh, uh, offer would be the contract, preferably the 7.0, all disclosures that are necessary to it, and then if it's cash, it'll be proof of funds. Okay, remember, the only way that they know that you have the money is the proof that it's in the bank. If it's a two hundred thousand dollar deal, they'll need something that says two hundred or more thousand dollars is in the lending institution. You send that along with the offer. If it's a finance transaction, meaning that there's going to be a loan involved, okay, you need at the minimum a pre-approval, you know, that says that they are approved up to whatever the, the dollar amount is. If we're talking about two hundred thousand, they're approved to two hundred thousand, and therefore they can afford this property. And then it has, of course, the lending institution. And all that stuff should be written on your contract anyway, okay? In addition to this letter that goes along. So the complete offer will have the contract, all disclosures, and then any either proof of funds or proof that they can get the money, if you will, okay? In our system, which is .loop, make sure to share. This is when you share. If you fill in all the information, then first all you really need at this point is your buyer, uh, you know, is your buyer, because hopefully you shared with them to get all the signatures. And then the next case is the listing agent, which once again, if you did that with right, it would have filled it out already for you, would have put their email in there. You share with that particular agent, boom, it goes into their mailbox. Remember, that only appears, no one needs to have that on the other side. You know, nobody needs to be a member of that loop or have anything. It's an email. It simply comes to them as an email, like anything else. So you share it. This is when you share it. Goes to the other side. Listing agent always check. You know, hey, things can go wrong. Okay, make a phone call, follow up, and in this phone call, you can do a couple of things. Did you receive my offer? Is the first thing. You know, I mean, give it more than one, you know, one second. You know, you just did it. You know, don't call them twenty seconds. Later, okay, you know, wait a half hour. Maybe an hour. I just sent you a contract. Have you received it? Yay, nay, whatever. Well, yeah, when you look, please let me know that you did. Give me confirmation that you did if they don't confirm it right there. If they have, say, when can I expect? Either way, it's your excuse to get, when can I expect an answer from you? Now, this is your perfect entry to get an answer because everybody wants to know when I'm going to hear from you. You know, because your client's going to ask you, when do you think I'm going to, I'm going to hear from them? So, this is your opportunity to you know find that out if it's got to be email if it's got to be a text you know whatever your method of <clears throat> conversation has been with this particular agent is the method you should do which is the same thing you should be doing with your client you know whatever their mode of you know of, of, of kind of conversation and whatever you're doing that should be the method that you should continue your uh, your deal with all right so now you've written this you've gotten it in typically this, this is done via phone call, text, or email, and two of the three methods for confirmation purposes. There are some brokers that require each alteration. So let's say they received your offer. You know, you offer two hundred and fifty thousand. You know, they, you know, they, they counter and say, and they're, let's say they're at two sixty-five or whatever the numbers are. Okay. Um, if you go by the book, everything should be in writing back and forth. Okay. Not common. In most transactions, certainly not in the city, typically. I've seen it done more in the burbs versus the city. But in the city, typically, it's call, text, whatever, back and forth, uh, conversation. Uh, it should be somewhere written. You know, that would be best, whether that be an email or text or something. So it's not just verbal, okay? Um, because let's say you offer 250, they're at 265, they counter at 260. Okay, somewhere, somehow, this should be written somewhere in an email or text, like I said. Okay, when you get to the, you know, oh, can we see it? Well, okay, you can do that. Anytime you make an alteration, remember, you just need an initial, whatever you alter. Okay, so if it goes up from 250 to 260, or whatever, they, they, they said 260, now you're going to go off to 255. You have to now get, make the, the, the alteration, whether that be in dot loop or however you're doing it. Cross out, and then you need an initial by your buyer, in this case, to 
initiate the change that does now occur, occur to a contract. Okay? So anything that a contract that alters, it's got to be signed. You don't have to resign the whole everything else. Nothing else changed, meaning, you know, the other the usual suspects that will change are typically price, you know, that's a biggie. Okay, closing date could change. Um, you know, and or sometimes, you know, money down, earnest money, initial earnest money. So, you know, the usual blanks, it's only three to five different blanks that'll probably change. And when they do, they need to be initialed and or something needs to be altered. You know, you can do that. A lot of that, once again, can be done over the phone. If they demand that you know I want to see that in writing, then you got to you know, kind of do it again. You can alter that in dot loop or however you want to do it and get it back to them. Sometimes it's only one page, you know, that changes. You know, I, I would just send them one page. Really, you got, they got the rest of the contract. You know. whatever, whatever they want. Most of the time, like I said, it can be done over the phone. Then when you get a final, okay, um, when the contract is finalized by both parties, you do a final share. So now you can alter everything. And let's say you agreed on terms, you're, you're at 260 or 259, you come to 259, the closing date slightly altered uh, to you know, whatever date you guys have agreed upon. Uh, and then there was a little bit of earnest money that changed. You know, you said, you know, 500, they went to 1500. And then after two days, you know, after the AI period, um, it, it's going to go to, you know, five grand or something like that. So all these things alter. You alter the contract, you redo it, you have to re-sign it. That one is easy from the standpoint of just do a new one, okay? Because it's literally, when they get it on the share side, it's just, that's all it is. It's 13 clicks, okay? There's nothing to it. If you, if you know how to use that loop properly, it's literally 15 seconds on their end. Okay, I don't care if you change it. I, I, when I did my first deals here, and I changed the listing, you know, numerous times, um, I had my client sign that contract conservatively 17 times. Okay, it was a friend of mine. Yeah, okay, which was good. So, uh, excuse me. I don't know. It's a new system to me. I said, just keep signing. Whatever I said. Okay. You know, so don't even be embarrassed. Okay, if it's a new system, it's okay. Okay. You know, I mean, I don't think he felt I was incompetent or anything like that. He knows I was not Mr. Technology. It was brand new to me. I literally just got here. And whatever. It's okay. You know, and, and it's not a lot of their time. Believe me. Signing on download is 20 seconds. Okay, so no matter how many times they do it, so you know, you've ruined in total three minutes of their life. Okay, other than they have to open up the email. Okay, but um, now with the dot loop, identify and write in all the context. Okay, when you get now that you've got a completed contract. Okay, now we're there. You know, it's completed back and forth. You have an executed what we call executed contract within dot loop. It's nice to label that as such, right in your loop, and call it executed contract. You know, now you can put the disclosure separate, you can put it all together, you know, however you want. But it's nice if you label it that way. You know, from our standpoint, when I look at things, you know, as the you know, supervisory person that looks at it, it's nice when it's labeled properly so that I know where to go. You know, I see some of these loops and it's like the Holy Scriptures. Okay, you know, there's, I don't know what's going on in there. Okay, and I'll go, Rob. Which one of these is the contract? You know, and some of them are just labeled scan 0532. Well, clearly that's an executed contract, right? Who doesn't know that? A um, little bit of a problem, okay? Try to label things properly, put it in there. Dialogue is a beautiful thing. If you do everything, it's easy for you to read too. I mean, well, I'm the one going in here and having to do that. But you know, you may know where it is because that's your only contract you're working on at that point. Uh, um, but Five weeks later, when you're going in there, it hasn't closed yet, you're going in, what was, what was scan 46983? <laughs> you might not remember at that point. Okay, try to label it. You know, label it properly. Um, you know, use, you know, use your uh, little bit of technology and get that get done right. Um, now you have all the players. The next thing to do is the add person section in dot loop. You can add all the people that are involved. You already have the listing agent, obviously, because you shared it with them. The next step is, getting all the attorney information. Now you have your attorney, you have their attorney, hopefully at some point you're gonna have it, you might not have it immediately, but at some point within the first week, three days, you should probably have that. Put that in the loop, you can add person, add person, add them in the loop, you know, and, and put their, at a minimum, put their email, 
And you know, like I said, this is all this stuff. It takes maybe an extra ten minutes out of your time to do it. But once it's in there, it's great. It's great. And I do that from the title side for you guys <coughs> to do it. And I'll have, I'll have you know all the uh, all the attorneys in there. I have all the people that are have to deal with title. You know, which are Jay. Uh, Adrian is the person that was here last night. He's over there. Sometimes I'll put him in there, but usually I put Jay and Crystal, who orders a lot of the river's title. So those two are in there. The loan officer should be in there. Okay, so you know the players that are part of this should all have their email and or phone numbers in there, and just fill it all out. It only makes it easier for you. You can truly be paperless and make this real easy by because then any document that comes in, share. Who do you want to share with? And all the names pop up. No, sure, go. I mean, just makes your life so much easier. So let's say the inspection comes in, okay? The inspection, first of all, gets shared, you know, with your attorney, okay? The attorney wants to see it. All you gotta do is upload it into, into dot loop, share it with the, uh, with the attorney. Boom, done, or specific pages, however you want to do it. All these different things, you know, it's very simple when all the names are in there, all the attorneys are in there, they just, then it's a two second process, everything. And it's all in the initial, once you get all the players, put them in. That's all you gotta do. Um, okay. Let's see here. This is part of this part. Okay, this includes both attorneys, I said, title agent, uh, for Rivers title, the lender, buyer's listing agent, and I'll share with all to make certain. Yeah, the first thing that I do, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit there. When I get a completed contract, you know, and I, uh, you know, I know some of you can you know, attest to that, I got executed, I got everything. I share it with everybody. So now every single player in here has everything. And I often get thank yous back from especially the lender. The lender's been kept in the dark the whole time. You know, lender, you know they're the only one that really needs it. I mean, forget about the attorneys, like I already told you what they do. Okay, you know, the one that needs it is the one who's going to give you the money. The most important person in this transaction is who's going to give you the money. Without that, you got nowhere. This deal is going nowhere fast. Okay, so they need to get when the, uh, uh, for example, the earnest money. Signed off earnest money. It says, Richard Williams, receipt 5 2 2019. I send it to everybody. They need to see that. They need to have it. Okay? That's imperative, you know, to the deal. So once that comes in, you know, which is usually a couple days later, whatever it is. But it's all follow up. You have to make sure. Now, if that money isn't there, you know, it's like, hey, Rick, have you seen the money? Has someone seen the money? Is the money around? You need to ask these questions and not just assume everything got done. Okay, because it doesn't get done. Trust me. Okay? And it only gets done, like if you're, like I said, if you're going to Rivers Title, well then it's going to get done. I'm going to make sure it gets done. Okay? But it shouldn't have to be that way. You should be the master of your own deal. You make sure that everything gets done. You know, I don't care what end you're on of it. You know, you've got to make sure because the attorney, trust me, he's got 10 other deals. He or she, no work here, okay, that the earnest money hasn't come in. You know, weeks go by, hey, did you ever get the earnest money? Says, well, 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 well. You don't even know you talk about okay? You know, and then you're expecting that the attorney would know everything about it. They don't have to. Okay, and you know, that's just common, okay? Um, all right, intro to the attorney in London. As the buyer's agent, the first thing that you should be doing, in your, introduce yourself via, via phone call to the buyer's attorney and his or her lender. Communicate that you are, their, their, you are their real estate broker in this transaction, and you'd like to be CC and any and all communication regarding your client, okay? It's only right, you should know everything. You, you represent your client. There's nothing that you should know in here. Any lender will say, absolutely, they respect you, like you wouldn't believe when you do that because you know what? Less than 50% of them do that. And they're like, I'm sure, appalled by that. It's like, what kind of broker is this? I mean, this is your deal. You want to get paid? Make sure it happens. Okay? The attorney. Some attorneys don't really like brokers. But you know what the ones they do like? The ones that actually know what the heck they're doing and do something like I just said. Introduce yourself to them. Hey, I'm the broker here. Take charge. This is what's going on. Okay, I want to be CC'd in. Even if you don't know what you're doing, pretend like you do. Okay, fake it till you make it. Let them know that you're there to help facilitate the transaction. This is why you're. This is why you're making the call, not just, hey, I'm just going to be a pain in your, you know, in your butt the rest of this transaction. 
Now, what do you need me to do? How can I help? Okay? You know, what documents do you want me to get? Is there anything I can help you with? Okay? Um, and that goes a long way. There are often times when they can't get a document. Things get hung up. Processes get hung up by lenders. Oftentimes, they can't get the employment. They, you know, they have to prove employment. They have to, there's umpteen things that lenders have to do. And when those lenders don't get it, you know what happens? It just sits there, okay? So if you, as the buyer broker, is not calling every once in a while to find out how is the transaction going, I've done this before. I've gone to the people's place of employment and picked up, found that it was sitting on Joe's desk and it needed to be on Harry's desk. I've literally gone to these places, I don't care what the company was, and said, hey, my client is trying to get a loan. Where is it? Where's your HR department? You know, you've got to be a little smarter than, you know, just figure out the process at a company. I mean, just think about it. It's not that hard, okay? It's a small company. It goes, it's got to get to the president eventually. Okay, he's been out of town for two weeks. He hasn't, he or she hasn't signed it, okay? Figure out another way. Say, hey, is he going to find his secretary? You know, you just, you got to think this whole thing out. If you want to get paid, figure out the process in every part of this deal and figure out how to fix it. Okay, because it doesn't fix itself. Okay, it doesn't. It just sits. It sits until somebody does something. And people don't do anything. Like lenders can't, they're not going to call that employment place every day. They're not. They'll wait two or three days. They don't hear anything. Huh? Then it sits there again. Then they call another two or three days. And your entire loan is being held up by somebody who's out of town in the Bahamas because he or she didn't sign the fact that this person worked there. This it happens all day, every day. Okay, just, you need to understand that. So you, you can fix stuff, you know, but you have to find out what's wrong. You can't fix it if you don't know what's happening. Okay? So these are the questions that you ask the lender, and they will tell you, the loan processor will tell you. Well, I sent out the uh, you know the application you know for a verification of employment. I don't have it back yet. How long has it been there? Oh, over a week. Really? Okay. You know that tells you something. Maybe you can go help. Uh, I'm looking for the HOA desk. It's kind of. I don't have that. Talk to the over there. Nobody seems to be getting back to me. There's something you can do. Okay. Find your find a way to facilitate and find yourself to be useful. Okay, um, all right, so you're going through this process, okay? <clears throat> you've initially set up everything, you've got everything going. Now, the next step is usually the inspection, okay? Within this five-day AI period, you've got an inspection coming, okay? So you as the buyer, oftentimes they'll ask you for a recommendation of who the inspector is. Great, if you supplied it, if you're not, they have their own, whatever the case may be. You, as the buyer agent, need to be there. That's one of the most important things in the entire transaction. Remember, you're their agent. You know, they, they need you. So, be there, okay? Um, identify the, the, the inspector. It should be done within the five business days. That's what, you know, it says it on the contract, five business days, okay? So, that's the AI period. So, you try to get it done on day two or three, so that if there are any issues, by day four, you figure it out, and day five, you ask for whatever you're going to ask for, or everything's okay, you know. But that's the way it works. Like I said, always attend the inspection of your client. This is your chance to truly bond with your client in regards to this home, you know, or condo, whatever it is, and to really learn from a good inspector about homes and all the inner workings concerning this home, okay? It's a way to learn. That's how I learn stuff. I've told people many times, I don't know how to do anything. I can't fix, you know, I can't open and close a drawer, okay? Not too good with stuff. Do I know how to do everything? There's nothing I don't know how to do. I can build a house from my head. I can't physically do it because I have watched hundreds of homes grow up from beginning to end. And I ask questions all throughout all my, you know, as an appraiser and, and as a broker, this is what I've done, okay? so. I know the different steps. I know what, you know, no cost, because I'll sit there and I'll ask. These are all the questions that you, you can learn. This is what makes you a better broker than the next person. You want to know what differentiates you 
from others. That's it. Stuff like that. Stuff that other brokers don't know. They don't even think about asking. Okay. Um, later in the evening or the following day, make sure that you receive a copy of the report. Generally, the inspector will give you that. You're there. You're, you're there. The other the person has to say, yeah, send it to my broker. You know, the, the actual client. And the actual client, in this case, is the buyer. Okay, but they will, usually, unless you have a bad relationship with your, with your buyer. Um, talk about it with the client, okay? Normally, there's one page of, all, of issues. You know, it's normally like 50, 60, 70 pages of stuff. But there's one page, or maybe two, if that's not good, it's two, um, of problems, okay? And they speak about them, okay? Then, the 7.0 is much more clear than the 6.1 was as to what is an issue and what's not an issue, okay? Talk about the important issues and decide the real issues to ask or not ask for regards into monetary, you know, from the seller, okay? So identify the pertinent issues that are appropriate to ask for, okay? As it states on the 7.0 pretty clearly now is that anything that you could have seen and should have known simply by walking in. You know, if you walk in here, well, let's take upstairs. If you walk upstairs, if you don't notice that the floor, floors are on a curve, okay, and I bowling alley, you know, put a ball down here. You know, things that are clearly evident should have been in your offer, right? I mean, why would you make an offer and, and then say, oh, I want, a, I want a carpeting credit. You didn't see that the carpeting was destroyed? Isn't that in your initial offer? That is an unacceptable ask. Okay? You cannot, the things that you're asking for after an inspection, it's not a renegotiation, okay? Everyone thinks an inspection then becomes a complete renegotiation. No. It's only for things that you could not have possibly known. Furnace. It's going to be dead tomorrow. Inspector reports. Death. R.I.P. May 3rd, 2019. Furnace. Put the cross out. Okay? You know, I'm being facetious, but but say it says that it, it, it's, it's not going to last long here. Roof. Completely shot. Now, I will contend that you should know a little bit more about roofs. I mean, that, to me, it's not very difficult to look at the roof. You can tell. You know, it's got 14 layers. You know, anything more than, you know, if it's this thick, you got problems. It's, you know, I don't care if it just was new last year. You, know, you shouldn't have three, four, five of them. Okay? Two, maybe three, yeah, three, more than three, you're getting a little crazy. Okay? You should, you should have been a tear off, in other words. Okay? You know, roofs often get replaced and they go right over the one. That's fine two or three times, but not four or five. Okay? Um, you should be able to eyeball and see that. Okay? Other things, you know, things behind walls, you know, electrical, things that you didn't know. Yes, those are real, and those are credit worthy, okay? You should get some sort of credit or whatever you're going to work out, okay? You identify the issues between you and your, this should be done, you know, everyone thinks, oh, get the attorney money. Once again, what are the attorneys for? They're simply, they write things, okay? If you want to know their role? They write. They know how to write, and they're good reporters, okay? So this is between you and your buyer. You should be discussing this. Say, okay, what's the real issues here? And what's your hold up? What's your hang up? You know, what are you concerned about, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer? Um, you talk. Then you determine, and hopefully with your advice and a little input, and if you want, call me. Many of you do, and that's fine. Um, and you determine whatever that is. Now, it's very common to ask for a little bit more than you think because, yes, then it becomes a negotiation of, of sorts, okay? Let's say you think there's $3,000 worth of stuff wrong, okay? Probably ask for thirty five. dollars okay? Now, be able to justify cost because if anybody actually questions you, you know, you should be able to know that, well, we're asking, you know, don't just say arbitrarily $3,500, okay? You should know what that's for. You know, cost about a thousand to do this, fifteen to do that, and another five hundred for this. There's your three grand. Okay, it shouldn't just be an arbitrary number. Okay, so once again, if you need, just call me. A lot of the stuff. I mean, I learned looking at Home Depot. I look at costs all the time. Okay, what and then it's double. Insulation is always double. If you just for best rule of thumb, 
If it costs five hundred dollars for a water heater, what's it cost, cost to put a water heater? Thousand. Done. Okay. It's not that hard. Okay. You can do things too. Okay. Yes, you can ask me, but you can do things yourself. None of this is rocket science. Okay. Uh, talk to people. You can find out. Uh, have the client inform his or her attorney of the dollar amount and formally write it up during the AI period. Once again, this is important. We just had one of our brokers. I got a call the other night. Um, or Johnny's a friend of mine as well, as far as the, the broker. Um, and uh, he had an attorney who he's never using again, that who he loved before. And that's what I said, please use our attorneys because I don't think that will happen. You know, and what happened was the AI period came and went, and they did not ask for the credit that they wanted. Now, legally, what happens here is you're done. You can't ask for anything more, and the next leg of the conversation becomes, can he or she get a mortgage? You're done. You did two other three things. They're already done. And the problem is the following. If you had only put down a thousand bucks, they probably would have walked. Well, here was the other issue. Five or ten, I think it's ten grand. There's ten grand in already, which is why I write my contracts at a thousand to initial with an additional nine after AI for this exact reason. No one knew this was going to happen. Of course, no one goes into knowing that your attorney is going to screw up the deal. Okay, which she did, and she admitted. So this is admitted and everything. Okay, but the bottom line is. It did. And the only way our broker could have protected his client a little bit better would have been to do what I just said. So then he only lost a thousand. Now they're about ten grand if they choose to leave. Well, now you know they can't leave, right? No one's leaving ten grand on the table. I don't, you know, I mean very few people will do that. Okay, I guess if it's two, three, four, or five million, maybe. But this is not what we're talking here. You know, a couple hundred grand. So 10 grand now is on the table. They didn't get any option to ask for what they wanted to ask for because the attorney messed up. And legally they have no recourse other than lose your earnest money, you know, because now they're in breach of contract. If they want to get out, they can't get out. The only way you can get out is by not getting a mortgage. Well, that we don't know yet, okay? So anyway, you resolve the issues with the attorney, assuming it came in on time and you do everything, okay? And you come to a number. Let's say you put on there 3,500, they came back, we'll give you three. And you go, okay, you sign off. It is not unusual for AI period, attorney inspection period, to be extended. If in fact, it didn't get resolved in five days, when I just told you about what happened, a normal thing that happens all the time. All that attorney had to do, she probably was at some function on a Friday at one o'clock and had to leave the office. But has she, has she been, yeah, you know, I'll say competent, what she should have done before she left the office was fire off a letter, it's a simple email. I want to extend AI period to Tuesday at six o'clock, five o'clock. Covered, done. Nothing more needed to have been done. Because even if it was one-sided, that's good. And they wouldn't have answered. Let's say they didn't answer. Doesn't matter. Attorney at least tried. And then you can have that verification because it was an email. The fact that it didn't happen, AI ran out. Nothing was stated. So there's where your fallacy was. You just need to send an email? It's all you need. Yeah. It's, very simple. it's a very simple question because they do have to respond. And they have an opportunity to do so. And if they did, because let's say they were off too, it was a Friday, happy hour, nice Friday, everybody finally got a good weekend, whatever it is, you know, oh, and I fired you out a letter, sufficient. So that would have sufficed, but it didn't happen. Okay, so once the AI, so it's very common to extend, so don't get crazy when AI gets extended, it happens all the time. Okay, a couple days later, because oftentimes the inspection report doesn't get finished, they don't agree on terms right away, it happens, it's okay. Okay. Um, so, next page here talks about this period is typically for five business days unless extended by the attorneys involved in transactions. All business matters, including inspection issues, attorney issues, condominium docs, etc., should be settled during this time frame. 
That is what this period is, is for. It's for discovery of all pertinent issues to the deal. Okay? After this period is concluded, you actually have a real estate deal with only one leg to confirm, and that's the mortgage, if there is a mortgage. Okay? So this is extremely important. So when this AI period ends, you got a deal. And this is why I recommend to let the, you know, remember a deal is only a deal if both sides are happy. A deal is not, you know, I screw the other person. Okay, that's not a good, it's not a good deal, I should say. Okay, so the bottom line is having the increased earnest money, as I suggested, with the 10 grand being there, you know, one at the beginning at night, there's no issues there unless you don't think you're going to get the mortgage, but even then you get your money back anyway because you can't get the mortgage. So I always say to my clients, what is your holdup? In giving, you know, if you get 50 grand, you know, how much were you going to put down? 100. Give them 50. What's the difference? You get the money back if you can't get a mortgage. All of this is holding the money. You know, these days, what, what kind of interest you get? 0.004%. You know, so you're getting a dollar 30 on your 50 grand. Okay? So it doesn't matter where it is. It's safe. It's fine. Okay? After AI, which is what I just went into. Yeah, because your next step is, I get my loan, we close. Period. Whether it's in your bank or the other bank, or wherever it is. So it's, it's, it's not a risk. There's really no risk there, post AI. Okay. There's also a good time to allow for the additional earnest money to transact. As I said, there's no risk at this juncture. If the financing falls through, your collector receives all our money back from the escrow account. Okay. Last page of this section is if the following, if the financing is secured, then all the monies in the escrow account are applied to the down payment for financing. So whatever's put in there, if your client's putting down, a, you know, a hundred grand, and fifty is in the earnest money at this point, okay, they got another fifty to put in. That's all. Uh, some, there are people that ask, you know, what, what, what does that money do or whatever? It's all part of the down payment. That's all it is. Okay. So now you you pass huge portions of your deal. After the AI period, there's typically this lull period for the broker that may result in some work uh, uh, via keeping up with your client and asking them if everything is in place with the loan and any other docs that may be required to have it closed. In addition, here's where you call the lender, ask if there's anything else you know that you that you can do to complete the loan package, ask when the appraisal is being done, a good lender that you, when you told them at the beginning you want to be connected, they'll tell you all the processes. Ah, the appraiser's coming, this is coming, so you're included. Even though you're not meeting the appraiser, the listing agent is. Remember, we talked about that at the beginning. That's who he or she has the keys. Okay? But you're included in the loop, as you should be. Um, ask the other side, hey, are you okay with the appraisal? Do you need anything? One of our brokers today is having an appraisal. I know it's going to be tough. I appraised it. Okay? This is going to be very tough for this appraiser. I supply counts for our agent to give to this guy. Okay? Because this is not going to be an easy one. Okay? So it's going to be very, very difficult. I know that. Okay, complete any work required to get condominium docs to the buyer. Condos are a little different animal. It's very uncommon in that five-day period that everybody got all their docs, condo stuff, and all that. It very rarely happens, even though it should. Okay, because I've seen deals get near the close or at close. Hey, uh, did any everybody read? Did anybody read the condo decks? And then it says, "Can't have renters." <laughs> Oh, I was buying this as an investment property. Oh, I don't want clothes. Oh, too late. Okay, this is why this stuff should have been done in AI. Okay, so happens. Happened. Seen it. Okay, a lot of stuff goes down here. Um, also in here, call, email the attorney, ask if there's anything they need to complete the file prior to closing. A lot of times, they don't have the time to go do the, you know, they're, their job, okay? So, you know what? I don't care. But ask me, and that's why I tell everybody at the beginning, if there's anything you need done, please ask me. I will have it to you in 24 hours. Because I will. It doesn't matter what they ask. It doesn't matter. I'll fly to another state if I have to, to get what they need. I can't, my wife works for United Airlines. Okay, so I, I don't care what they ask. I will get it done. Because all this stuff is holding up the loan, holding up, um, you know, the attorney process, something is happening, if in fact it is, in which oftentimes it is, you know, and you can help oftentimes. So, 
Find out. Call your client. Let them know that the attorney will be getting the figures to them about a week to a few days prior to closing so that they know what the amount of money to bring to the club. Because this is all these are questions about how much do I bring? What am I doing? You know, you know, where am I? Who am I? You know, where's Waldo? Um, they have all these questions. A good broker is addressing all these issues all throughout this. You know, this is like I said, this is a lull period kind of from AI period to the end. Okay, but there's things that need to be done. Get them ready for what's going to happen. Um, tell your client to go to the bank and have a cashier's check made out to the clients to their name. Okay, they can write it, down, write it to themselves. If there's an overage, the check will be immediately refunded at closing via a check from the title company. If they're short, it's a bit of a problem, they'll, they'll be able to write a, a personal check for up to a thousand. I've seen it extended beyond that, but usually a thousand bucks. You know, you can write a bulk and a personal check. Okay? Um, also, closing instructions here. About a week prior to the actual closing date, an actual formulated closing time and date is sent out to all parties involved with the transaction. Okay, so you should get that kind of email. Hey, we're closing, you know, Tuesday, 5 o'clock at, you know, so and so uh, location. Okay, now everybody confirms. As the buyer's agent, I believe it's imperative to be at the closing for your client. Once again, it's, to me, it's kind of like the inspection. This is that you know, a lot of times if it's a first property or whatever, it's a big deal. Um, it's the last time you'll be together, a very important time for them to show you, the, you know, the, the conviction that you have, uh, excuse me, to your clients. Okay. Um, at this juncture, you can also formulate a plan as to what type of closing gift you'll be able to get for your client. It's my rec recommendation to give a five to ten percent of your commission to the proceeds of the closing gift. A lot of people, I re I'm reading this more and more as a great thing. You can do things, one of the coolest things, if you want to promote yourself and also give them a gift, throw a dinner party, okay? Greatest thing ever, okay? Throw a dinner party at their place, okay? And you provide all the food and do everything. A lot of people, this has become more and more common, and not cheap either. You know, five to 10% could actually be a pretty good party, okay? But what is it doing? Promoting the heck out of you, okay? You know, you, you know, have them invite some of the neighbors, this and that, you know, and you're basically sponsoring. It's kind of a cool thing. It makes a lot of sense, too. It's like a free open house. You know, they have, yeah, it's their house. You're providing this kind of a closing gift. And you can get something small, too, besides that. But I mean, now you're throwing them a pretty big party. Okay? And you're promoting yourself. I just sold them this house. I did this. It's kind of a cool way to look at this. Okay? Make arrangements with the listing agent concerning how to get the keys to the, at the closing. Okay? Just figure out how it's going to happen. If it's in a key box, can I just pick up the key, take it to the closing? You know, you never give that key to the buyer until its deal is done. Okay, never, ever, ever, ever. Okay, and I mean closed, paper signed, and you know, congratulations, you own the house. Then you give keys. Okay, we uh, one step that before you know closing is the final walkthrough that we put in here. About a week before the actual closing date, we set up a final walkthrough. What you're doing in a final walkthrough is making sure that the property appears the way it's supposed to be. If there were um, any type of things that they were supposed to repair, if that was in the AI period that you discussed, they should be repaired. If it's only a closing credit, then okay, that's going to be credited at the closing, that's fine. Okay, but make sure that everything looks the way it's supposed to look, because it can look very different from when they moved all the furniture out to the point when it was all furnished and you know the walls were all <laughs> you know, the guy moved the furniture and boom he cracked the wall and cracked the hole right through the wall or god knows what can happen you know there's a lot of weird things that can happen on a move up so this is your time if there is an issue i do final walkthroughs about an hour or two before closing and or the night before if we got like a nine or a seven o'clock closing okay um the latest you can right before closing for the reason of this. Something could happen. Anything could happen. And you want to make sure that you see it. I've been to closings, or I've been to the final walkthrough, and they said the disposal, they were going to fix it. They didn't fix it. I get to the closing, you know, uh, and I go, whoa, well, I actually call the agent right away. I think we did it like six, seven o'clock that night before the closing, morning closing. And I said, whoa, you didn't, you know, it's not fixed. Oh, and I said, well, it'll be, you know, $500. You know, it costs like $350, but 
He goes, okay, good. Well, here's the problem. Had I not gone into closing, nobody knows about this. You think the listing agent was going to speak up? I don't think so. Okay, because she was Okay, and she didn't. I got there, and, uh, and, and I go, you know, hey, you know, because remember, all the paperwork's pretty much done. Okay, and they did it without this $500 credit, which now is going to be a part of the deal. Okay, and uh, I said, hey, did everyone take in place the 500 bucks? Huh? 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 What are you talking about? Okay, well, I told her what I was to talk about. She happened to be there. I hadn't met her before. And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah. The attorney was like, what are you talking about? The other attorney, you know, he was just speaking. And, and uh, but the, the listing agent goes, no, 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 he's right. We didn't fix the disposal. Boom, they had to redo all the paperwork. But you just saved your client 500 bucks. Okay, that's why you go to the closing. My contention is, it would have closed and nobody would have mentioned anything. Okay, my client's a pretty sharp dude. He's, he was a, he is an accountant. I don't know how, would, he, would he have mentioned it or not. You know what I mean? If he was left to his own devices and not his own. I'm not sure that would happen. You know, okay? So, once again, important to be there. At closing, you should be there, introduce yourself to the closer, the attorneys, and the seller if you have that met. It's important to know all the players. Listen intently at the closing. Make sure that everything is proceeding exactly as it should. You know, it's not your job to sit there and talk and jibber jabber. You know, but what it is, listen, you can learn a lot of stuff. Impart a bit of knowledge if appropriate uh, to, the, uh, to the banter that is going around within the, within at the closing, okay? Calculate your commission due. It's the first time that I even consider. Usually it's a day before, but you know, I mean, to be honest, I never look at commission. It is irrelevant to a deal. You should be representing your client. That's it. And then when it comes time, oh, what am I gonna make? That's the only time you should start really calculate. And I can honestly say that is what I do. I know it's not what 95% of the people out there do. You know, but I don't really care about my client. I know I'm gonna make some money. I don't always know what it is. I mean, and then I get pissed over it. Oh, it's two percent. But it's not what you should be looking at. Okay? And whether or not you buy or sell that house. Um, Calculate your commission due, ensure that the check paid to KO Realty is for that amount. Okay, that's when you should make sure that it's right. Okay, you should be able to calculate that. It's not rocket science, it's pretty easy to figure. Because it'll say 2.5% minus 3 and a quarter or whatever it says. That should be the amount based on the net. You know, if it was 200, you know, 250 grand, 250 grand times 2.5%, you know, minus whatever the fee was on the listing sheet. It says it, whatever it says, that's it. That's the contract. If it's different than that amount, something's wrong. And you need to ask. You don't ask necessarily the title company or this net. You can ask the other agent, they don't know. Um, you, yeah, you're probably gonna have to ask, you know, the attorney, the attorney and the yeah, attorney, they don't know anything either. Ask the title agent. Okay? So why is this this number? Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Something's right, right. The only one that really knows is, for example, rock. Rob does the calculation. So everybody has a Rob. Okay? You know, CB has a Rob. Remax has a Rob. So the only one that knows that answer is that person. So that person is not sitting at the closing, is what I'm getting at. So most of the people there don't really know what's going on. Ensure that you receive a closing statement and a check made out to Kale before leaving that title company. You must have a closing statement because every brokerage requires two things the check and the closing statement. Okay? Those are the two things. Okay, um, closing time, um, last part here, is hand over the keys to the buyer if they are in possession of them and congratulate them. Give them their closing gift and remind them that any referral is greatly appreciated at all times. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.